Gabe, uh, your awesome MC slash biophysics major here at Hopkins. Um, if you're interested in patent law like me, we're really excited to have this intellectual property kind of panel to talk about more about the patenting system, um, exactly like what is that and how is that used in the fight for access to medicine or used against the fight for access to medicine. And we have some really cool speakers that are going to be joining us. So is Alex on Zoom? Awesome. So um, I'll now call up our first speaker, who is Alex Moss, joining us all the way from Zoom. Um, I'll give a small introduction. Um, Alex is the executive director at the Public Interest Patent Law Institute. It's a nonprofit dedicated to making sure patents do what they're supposed to do, which is promote innovation and access for all. Alex has an amazing history as an attorney, graduating from Stanford Law School, working at very prestigious law firms, and with the Mark Cuban chair to eliminate stupid patents at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. In 2019, she spoke at the National Academy of Sciences and testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee on the State of Patent Eligibility in the US. So here to talk about patenting systems, monopolies, public interest patent law, and more, I'm happy to present Alex Moss. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me and, and see me? Awesome. Well, thank you all. I'm so grateful to be here and particularly honored to be, you know, part of a panel with uh, Gabriel and Peter, whose work I respect and admire so much. Um, and thank you all. Uh, there are a couple of UAM students who are helping us do amazing things. And I wish I could be there in person, but I'm really thrilled to be here virtually. Um, all right, I'm going to dive in and I'm going to try to share my screen and do with a few slides. I am not great at uh, Zoom or at PowerPoint, so hopefully this will work. Um, if not, let me know here. Let's see, uh, this will stop others. All right, let's do it. And Everybody, all right, view. No, I, I just had, thank you everyone. Here we go, whatever. Outline view. There we go. All right, Um. thank you. I think hopefully, Somebody wave madly if that's not working. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what patents are and what they do, ways that patents are abused, and then what we all can do about it. And hopefully this will be helpful background for what Gabriel and Peter are gonna be talking about and the amazing things they've been doing and, and are happening. Um, so first is what, what do patents do? Um, and what they're supposed to do is describe and claim an invention and Invention means something that's new and that isn't obvious based on what came before it, uh, but it's very broad. And if anybody's taken time to look at patents, they cover everything from peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to sort of the truly absurd, like a, a leash for your pet snake is, is, a, is one of my favorites. Um, what somebody who owns a patent can do is, is it's actually not a permission for them to make or do anything. It's really a right to stop others from doing, making, using, selling, whatever their patent claims. And when I say a right to stop people, it really means a right to sue people for doing that. And the idea is that the public is getting information about what the invention is. And then when the patent expires, the public's gonna be able to use that information Freely. And some context I think it's helpful is that the, the patent system is a creature of like the 18th century. And that's an era before the internet, where now, you know, when we, there's more information than we can imagine, and it's almost impossible to take that information away once it's online. But in the, you know, 1700s, if somebody came up with something cool and, you know, they died, very likely that that would like die with them. And, and maybe I think, you know, the dark ages hadn't been that long ago. 
understandable to have a concern about how do we make sure people are disclosing the cool stuff they do in a way that we can save it for perpetuity. So why do we have patents? That idea of, of really making sure that information is available to the public and also that we're getting these new inventions available to the public. So it isn't a private compensation system. It is supposed to be something that benefits the public by generating more inventions and more information. And you know, the idea is really that it is a way to encourage inventors to create. And one of the ways it theoretically does that is by preventing free riding. So the fear is that if, if somebody invests all this time and money into making something, and then other people can copy them, but without making those investments, they can effectively free ride on all the research and development work that went into it. And if they do that, well, then they can sell the invention, sell the product for less. And the person who really invented it won't recover their investment and won't innovate in the future. And, and the idea that patents are supposed to help people make sure that they can sort of extract this monopoly profits for a limited period is based on that idea. But it is, the idea that in the aggregate, we want that to be happening because in the aggregate, we want there to be more uh, investment and more innovation. It's really not a, a private right or a private compensation. Uh, and despite that, <laughs> uh, today, you know, companies depend on patents to make a lot of money. Um, and the patent office is unusual uh, because it's completely fee-based. So none of our tax dollars fund it. All of its money comes from the fees that patent owners pay to get patents. And overwhelmingly, it is the fees they pay to get patents, not the fees they pay to apply for patents. So there's different stages of fees and the patent office really depends on the, the fees that patent owners pay to, to get the patent and to keep it. And as a result, there are incentives for companies to get lots of patents and for uh, the patent office to grant lots of patents. This sets us up for ways that patents are abused. And when I refer to patent abuse, what I mean is when patents get and enforce patents that they really sh that really shouldn't exist. Patents that don't describe or claim things that are truly new, non-obvious and useful. Uh, there are different types of these. You can have overbroad patents that block research like a patent on a compound that prevents others from trying to figure out what might be useful. Uh, you've also got patents that are on things that are, are really not inventions. This is often talked about in the evergreening context. Someone's come up with a compound and now here's a particular dosage, once daily dose regimen. Um, and those make it uh, allow companies to block competition with products that might otherwise be available, especially when that original patent expired. Uh, and if you combine these, the combination of broad patents and then patents on things that aren't really inventions, uh, you get what we call patent thickets, which are these kind of dense areas of technology where there are lots of patents and each patent that exists makes it more difficult for somebody to do research or compete in that field because they'd, they'd have to overcome that patent. They'd have to, if, if they might get sued, they'd have to prove they don't infringe, that they don't use what the patent's claiming, or they have to prove that the patent doesn't exist. And the cost of doing that is, is astronomical, millions of dollars generally in court. So each additional patent sort of exponentially increases the costs of, of doing research or competition in that field. Um, and, but what, what a patent thicket looks like, this is thanks to, thanks to our friends at IMAC. Uh, this is kind of a, a, a picture that shows how over time a company might start with patents on a compound. Those are the ones in blue. And over time, they start moving to patents on particular methods of treatment, like a daily dosage regimen. And this is in terms of the number of patent applications. If you add them all up, it's like a staggering number. Uh, so you've got a lot of patents. And what you've also got as a result of this system is you've got 13 extra years of exclusivity 
from when the first patent would have expired to when the last patent would have expired. And so patent terms are 20 years. That, that's almost almost twice as long uh, as, as companies are really supposed to get in terms of exclusivity. Um, so what, what can we do? Uh, first is sort of like, we can actually do a lot. Um, you know, there are, you know, patent owners, especially pharmaceutical companies are really powerful. They have a lot of money, but ultimately the number of people that use things that are covered by patents far outnumber the number of people who, and companies that make money off of patents. Um, so, you know, there is, uh, you know, an enormous potential in terms of the, interests of people who are using stuff that's covered by patents to, to actually play a much bigger role. Um, and there are all kinds of you know, entities that affect the patents that exist and the way that they're used. One set is you know, the branches of government, right? The executive branch enforces the laws, Congress makes them and the courts apply them, which is often in patent law really makes a big difference in shaping what those laws are. And those are always that we can have an effect on patent policy. Also, we can have effects on the way that entities that get patents behave. That could be universities or private companies or individuals in terms of both the types of patents they get and the ways that they enforce them. And I know UAM does you know, an enormously important work in that space. Um, and of course, also through the public sector and through nonprofits that do amazing things, both in terms of their own advocacy through these different channels, as well as doing other uh, other ways of, of changing the way that innovation works and of bringing um, innovation to people and increasing access. So there really is a whole set of different things that that we can do that can make the system better. And you know, critically, though there are a lot of people that are affected by the patent system, most of them probably don't know that or don't think about it very often uh, or don't care very much. I, you know, I don't know if I haven't, I haven't been to a cocktail party lately, but when I, when I last went, you know, talking about patents was a good way to send people running sometimes. Um, so one of the most important things too, is really just increasing, you know, public awareness and engagement and having people understand that like, Patents are really a part of our world. And if you care about the world, you care about equity, um, you actually do care about patents, whether you know it or not. Um, and you know, historically, there have been times where patents were things people cared a lot about. In the 1900s, um, Congress used to do the term extensions. Now the patent office does term extensions, mostly for drug companies, but Congress used to grant them. And they granted a term extension on a patent that covered a, a machine for making wood planks, which was really critical for the construction industry. And I like to say that um, people in Philadelphia, where there was a you know, big construction industry, they were so outraged that, that there were like riots in the streets about uh, Congress extending the patent term. So, you know, it, it, you know, this is something that people have cared a lot about. And I'm not suggesting we, we should hit the streets, uh, but there's certainly a lot of space for more engagement and more involvement in, in patents and patent policy. Um, and with that, I think talk, you turn it over to the people who are doing so much uh, of that and, and thanks. And if anybody has questions um, or ever wants to talk about patents, please feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm Alex at uh, PIPLIUS.org. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Alex. That was a really interesting like look into what patents are and like that graphic on a patent ticket was really, really cool to see. Thank you for that. Okay. Well, also for questions, we'll have like a 15 minute question and answer section at the end. So stay tuned for that and feel free to ask your questions then. Next up, we have Dr. Gabriel Robbins, who I think has a very cool first name being named Gabe. Um, yep. Dr. Robbins is a postdoctoral fellow at JHU's new Critical Studies or Critical Approaches in Science, Technologies, and Medicine, part of the History of Medicine's department. She is a historical ethnographer dedicated to the understanding of politics of health, medicine, body, and environment in Madagascar. Dr. Robbins has an illustrious career and a history of accolades as well, graduating with a PhD from MIT, publishing a book called Meaningful Compounds, The Language of Politics and Medicine in Highland Madagascar, which looks at how therapeutics relate to social and future aspirations. So here to give us a fresh perspective on IP ownership, 
how tech transfer works in low and middle income countries and insights from our work in Madagascar, Dr. Robbins. Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Does, does it matter if I get up and walk around? Because, okay, great. Sitting down is hard to talk. Um, all right. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us on a Sunday and on a holiday. I really appreciate being here. Um, and thank you, Gabe, for that beautiful introduction. Um, today, I'm going to share insights on efforts to reimagine drug development and production in the island nation of Madagascar, uh, because I do think that the case of Madagascar has a lot to teach us about on the ground efforts to build equitable drug industries. Uh, slide, please. So in 2020, Madagascar's uh, response to the COVID-19 pandemic was essentially to try to jumpstart jump start a domestic drug industry overnight. By October 2020, the island had inaugurated a new government-supported drug factory pictured right here um, in the capital, Antananarivo, which is right here, um, in order to manufacture pharmaceutical treatments for COVID-19, as well as other necessary uh, generic medicines for the Malagasy population. And speeches celebrating this new factory, the Malagasy president, Andrew Etzelina, who's right here, uh, said how he hoped Madagascar would become a sort of factory for the African continent or a, a pharmacy for Africa. And the factory site itself suggested a radical break with the status quo of wildly unequal sort of pharmaceuticalized global health with this huge slogan on the side of the building, changing history with science. We should notice here at first the irony that this slogan is in French, the language of Madagascar's colonizer and the language still used by the island's tiny elite. Um, with that original irony in mind, I want ooh, to, um, to walk us all through sort of how this state of affairs became possible, how the government was able to inaugurate a new pharmaceutical industry in the opening months of the pandemic, and why the Madagascar, what the Madagascar case has to teach us about uh, equitable drug industries more generally in the global south. Um, so slide please. So I really think that we should see this drug factory as uh, one example of this push towards drug industry localization. Localization is basically the idea that drug supply chains and distributions of intellectual property need to kind of radically rearrange, right? Um, instead of being clustered in uh, global north hubs like Europe or America, uh, the manufacturing capacity and R&D capacity should be able to sort of um, spread more widely throughout the globe. Pushes for localization are on the rise in the aftermath of the pandemic, which when fractured global supply chains led to widespread, widespread drug shortages, um, and we saw sort of rest restrictive IP limit access to necessary vaccines as well as other treatments. Um, you know, vaccine maps like this one sort of frame Africa generally, Madagascar specifically is empty of therapeutic resources. You know, notice uh, single digit percentages of the Malagasy population has been vaccinated and localization really attempts to sort of offset that emptiness. So today I want to share a historical and anthropological approach to Madagascar's drug industries to really think about um, some of the major issues facing this process for localization. Uh, using the history of the, facu uh, the factory during World War II, I'd like to show you how this call for localization is actually not new. We see this as a response to many different types of global crisis. Um, once World War II energy, or once World War II ended, the energy to sustain this call for rearranged glove, uh, drug manufacturing really dissipated. Uh, by the 1950s, we saw all of the attempts to reestablish drug manufacturing in Madagascar kind of just end. Um, we did see limited success in developing research institutions in Madagascar during the end of the 20th century, especially a sort of lauded uh, drug development institute there. But I'll also show you how many of these kind of maintains unequal social relations within the island, even as they att attempt to sort of mitigate global inequality. And so now as we really face sort of post COVID calls for reimagining drug industries, I think that this has, uh, we need to ensure that this critical mass of energy like does not wane as it did in previous periods of global crisis. And we need to consider what equitable drug industries look like to pay attention to power across scales from the local to the global, you know, from the producer to the researcher. Uh, slide, please. Okay, so the factory slogan is nominally to change history with science. And we can ask sort of what histories are these changing? Um, which are they continuing? The factory tried to intervene in this global status quo, one where Kaushik, in Kaushik Sundarajan's word, these imperialist relations of power um, and production remain a part of the formerly post-colonial um, 
global condition. We know, for example, that humanitarian global health projects and pharmaceutical industries globally tend to take this whack-a-mole approach to, uh, to disease in the global south. You know, you try to eradicate malaria, you try to get rid of malnutrition, instead of strengthening health systems as a whole. And meanwhile, as Alex discussed, this sort of abuse of intellectual property regimes turns drug molecules and drug production processes into elite assets. Uh, which makes it difficult to establish independent or competitive activities in under-resourced contexts, especially ones like Madagascar. Uh, so this drug factory and the, in the aftermath of the pandemic really tra traded in this narrative of medicine for Malagasy by Malagasy, attempted to increase abilities to both make new therapeutic compounds, develop them, and then uh, produce them on the island. And this is a picture in one of the factories. But instead of just changing history, this factory also builds on much wider efforts to build drug industries on the island. Um, so I want to quickly lay out the history of um, drug production on the island during World War II, because I think it helps us really see that these calls for localization are very much not new. Um, uh, slide, please. Okay, so this is a factory outside Funer and Sioux City, which is a 12-hour bus ride from the capital. Uh, it's where I've conducted much of my research. And this supplies ingredients um, now for the COVID-19 therapies that the government produced. It also supplies um, uh, therapeutic compounds for export to countries like, or companies like Novartis. Um, this factory was started exporting um, medical ingredients in the 1980s, but before that, it was a meat factory. What does meat have to do with drugs, you ask? Uh, many therapeutic compounds can be produced from animal byproducts. And during the global um, disruptions of World War II, this factory sort of rejiggered uh, its entire approach and started producing um, therapeutic compounds from meat wastes, essentially, and sending them to hospitals throughout the island. Um, Funer and Sioux is so important for medical care on the island that it's called the Hospital of the South. This area is very key for provision of um, therapeutic resources to the vast majority of the island's southern population. Uh, and so you had this situation in World War II um, where far before the global spread of COVID-19, Madagascar really dealt with the global crisis by turning to the self-sufficient production. Um, so we see that localization is a kind, kind of common sense response after global crisis. The moment we're in post-COVID has happened before. We can really ask ourselves sort of like, is, is, um, is history repeating itself here? Um, and it didn't really stop after World War II. This uh, factory's sort of efforts to treat the global or the Malagasy population catalyzed these calls in the 1950s uh, to build drug production on the island. Slide, please. All right. And this was really in line with WHO policy at the time. A 1949 report by the WHO really called for regionalization of drug development and drug manufacturing in order to uh, produce cheaper drugs and ensure treatment access for the sickest and the poorest populations. Somehow between 1949 and now, um, you know, like the, the energy really pivoted towards very distributed global supply chains, but at least in the, in the immediate post-war period, um, it was a sort of international recognition that there needed to be serious increases in uh, regional manufacturing capacity. So a coalition of Malagasy and European doctors that had been involved in scientific research on the island really started to try to pressure the French colonial administration to establish new drug factories, as well as establish new uh, institutions for drug research and development. Here you can see Paul Baranger, who was one of these, um, but they encountered very intense resistance from the French colonial regime at the time. Madagascar was a colony. It was expected to pay for its own expenses, as well as generate profit for uh, the French state. If you're dedicating land to drug factories and medicinal uh, plants, that's less land that you're dedicating to crash crops for export. Um, and the French were very opposed to the idea that there would be this sort of rearrangement in, um, in uh, land and industrial uh, capacity. The French Minister for Health uh, disparaged Baranger and his Malagasy compatriots as communists. He refused to support the project. The factories that they were attempting to build in the 1950s were all abandoned for lack of state funding um, and were really sort of like left to rot. You can actually still sort of like see the ruins um, in some of these areas. Uh, and so it was really sort of reinforcing this raw material export um, process instead of really robustly investing in Malagasy abilities to treat themselves. So by 1955, this dream sort of kicked off by the World War II uh, self-sufficiency really had ended. Uh, slide, please. 
However, at the same time, while you had this reduction in self-sufficient manufacturing capacity, you did have an increase in research institutions in the capital dedicated to examination of Madagascar's medicinal plants. Um, Albert Rakutu, oh, go ahead, uh, Ratsimamanga, who's pictured here, um, founded the Madagascar Institute for Applied uh, Research, IMRA, in 1958. This is the sort of premier institution in Madagascar right now that attempts to do drug development from the island's sort of vaunted biodiversity. The island is a biodiversity hotspot. Um, over 90% of these are endemic. It houses over 5% of the world's biodiversity on 0.004% of the world's landmass. And so IMRA has cataloged over 6,000 medicinal plants, developed many novel therapies, including the COVID-19 drugs that were manufactured at this facility. Um, and as well as treatments like Madagascar, which is licensed by Roche, uh, Madagluso, which is uh, manufactured domestically, and now CVO Plus, which is the island's COVID-19 treatment and preventative. In scholarly work on IMRA, Authors usually frame it as this example of a successful research institute that can protect against viral piracy um, and globally unequal patent regimes. In these tellings, it's institutions like IMRA that can sort of empower local researchers, help them get access to patents on their novel um, therapies, as well as expand global South access to uh, necessary drugs, as well as sort of like right the inequalities of global IP. For example, IMRA's development of Madagascar, like I said, which is licensed by Roche, is, this, is heralded as this sort of humble institution that's gaining some kind of parity with the kind of big dogs of global pharmaceutical industries. Uh, and many reports about Im IMRA really emphasize this kind of diminutive status in comparison to um, these kind of global behemoths. Um, its success from humble beginnings is often celebrated, including on its website. Um, and it's really framed as a sort of counterweight to global drug, drug industries. And I do think that this success is something to celebrate, but comparing it to major Euro-American companies really misses the institution's role in Madagascar. Can you hit the slide? Um, far from humble beginnings, Emra was established by members of the island's tiny elite. Uh, Rakutu Ratsimamanga is descended from the island's pre-colonial aristocracy. He was one of the very few researchers who was educated abroad in France. Um, and he's also one of the few Malagasy scientists to actually be able to hold very many patents. He's the largest patent holder in Madagascar. Um, this ability to access those educational resources and continue the process of um, accessing IP for Malagasy researchers has not seriously extended. Um, beyond beyond Ratsimamanga's raid, uh, sort of leadership of this institute. Uh, Malagasy society is highly unequal. Access to uh, key sort of educational opportunities remains very restricted. Uh, many people that want to uh, sort of like gain a purchase in the island's medical industries are sort of dependent on education abroad. Um, and so as we push for more, uh, more equitable drug development and drug access, we can really ask ourselves how expanding and diversifying drug R&D in these global contexts can, or global South contexts, can maximize equality both at a global level and at a local and regional level. How can Malagasy research institutions be strengthened? How can new generations of Malagasy researchers be empowered to protect their inventions? How can educational institutions on the island be strengthened so that access to international education is not a barrier of access um, for these industries? And how can scientific research also be made accessible across these sort of deep divisions in a highly unequal context like Madagascar's? Um, and as, so IMRA attempts to collaborate with these uh, domestic drug production facilities, especially to make drugs for the Malagasy population. And on that note, I just want to briefly conclude uh, with the return to the COVID-19 drug factory in Fionnurinsu to really think about how pushes for global equity in IP access do not always translate to pushes for equity in the entirety of the drug supply chain. Um, can you hit, a, hit the slide, please? All right. So IMRA was essential for developing the novel COVID-19 therapeutics um, that are processed in Fionnurinsu and in Antananarivo. But beyond that intellectual labor, ordinary Malagasy farmers and factory workers are responsible for the everyday work that makes these medical supply chains possible. So on one hand, you have research and development, very important, but ultimately that research and development is to produce commodities that can be made on the island and can be used by the island's population. 
And in my research, it became very clear that calls for equity on the level of global intellectual property protection don't always translate into calls for equity on the level of global um, actual drug production. When you look at social relations between all of these people involved in these industries, farmers, factory workers, office workers, scientific researchers, you can see these sort of very intense social hierarchies playing out on the ground. Um, ultimately, drug production for Malagasy by Ma Malagasy can still entail abusive or exploitative practices. And I think as we, as we call for more equitable drug industries, keeping uh, an idea in our minds of how much that ex extends is very crucial. So for example, uh, farmers who grow medicinal plants are paid on aver an average of 35 cents per kilogram of dried leaves. Uh, many report that this price is not at all sufficient to support their cultivation or their production. Um, and so it's one thing to have a patent for Malagasy made medicine. If you wanna actually put that into sustained production to be able to treat your population, you do need to have a supply chain where it actually makes sense for people to participate, right? Um, so especially because the Malagasy population most rely on small scale agriculture to feed themselves. So when you're growing medicinal plants, on, by definition, you're not growing food. Uh, so many farmers encounter these trade-offs between uh, plant cultivation for medical industries versus food cultivation to support their families. And many of the farmers that I work with have actually abandoned these production contracts uh, because it was not sustainable or feasible for them. Many encountered like increasing food insecurity actually. Um, also, this, these factories are often located in semi-rural areas and have made promises to improve education and investment in these communities that are often not maintained. So the factory in Fyrner and Sioux, for example, largely hires like already very well educated urban um, inhabitants and buses them there um, rather than investing in, in the local community. Um, so as we try to reduce abuse of patent protections, how can we also reduce abuse of communities that make these medicines? Okay, slide, I have like a very brief conclusion. Um, so here are some major takeaways from this research. I think that the World War II history of this drug factory helps us see how calls for localization are a common response to global crisis. However, from the 1950s limits on drug manufacturing on the island, we can also see that structure strengthening local drug industries is deprioritized when the immediate crisis point is over. Uh, from IMRA's history, we can see how there have been some success in developing research institutions on the island, including ones, uh, you know, like select individuals that have been able to access patent protections for their inventions. But if we look at IMRA in relation to Malagasy society, not just in relation to global pharmaceutical industries, we can see that these institutions can also still largely enforce rather than mitigate uh, how power operates in Malagasy society. And so the COVID-19 experience has made clear to me that we're in another period of sort of crisis response. We're remaking global medical industries is this urgent question. And I think our responsibility now is twofold. One, to ensure that this question doesn't fall away in the first place once the immediate crisis is over, but that the energy is sustained um, so that we don't have another, you know, like French or health minister saying, well, you know, you can't make your factories. Um, and we also have to ensure that whatever new medical industries are built are ones that strive for empowerment and equity at all levels, from the local to the global, um, from research all the way through to production. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a really interesting presentation. Oh, sorry. Are you going this way? Okay, cool. That was a really interesting presentation, and it was interesting to learn so much about this, like, case study scenario, especially given like yesterday's keynote speaker, Dr. Mogunga kind of talked about like this broad policy. So it's really interesting to go into a specific scenario and look at what's been happening. Thank you. All right. Our next speaker is Peter, Peter Maberduk. And Peter is um, the Access to Medicines Director for Public Citizen, a nonprofit consumer advocacy organization that champions public interest in the halls of power. Throughout his career, Peter did some pretty incredible things, graduating at a JD from UC Berkeley in 2007, and has gone on to provide technical and strategic counsel to government agencies and health organizations across the world, sits on the government boards of the UN's Medicine Patent Pool, and has founded the International Professional Partnerships for Sierra Leone, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting the public sector development and one of the world's least developed countries. An advocate, lawyer, and apparently a composer of music, I present Peter. Thanks so much. I got a whole speech, so I'm coming up here. Um, that's a very old picture, sorry, as you can see. Okay, so um, 
Universities Allied for Essential Medicines is positioned to make a critical difference this year in one of the most important policy decisions in the world on intellectual property and access to medicines. The National Institutes of Health, the world's largest funder of biomedical research and development in nearly $50 billion a year, contributing to the development of many, if not most, new medicines, will for the first time propose global access plans for government-owned inventions. This is a critical opportunity. Will those publicly funded medicines, like the world's most effective COVID vaccine, NIH Moderna, be available to all, be affordable for all? Will developing countries be able to manufacture, to help, <laughs> that was awkward. Will developing countries be able to manufacture to help supply their people with timely medicines and in times of shortage and contribute in turn to scientific advancement? And can those plans be extended not only to government-owned medicines, but the considerably larger galaxy of government-funded medicines? Now, the answers to those questions depend in significant part on us, on all of us in this room. The extent to which we raise our voices, offer our perspective on, and ideas to move NIH, to move our universities, to develop the values and organize the influence of the biomedical research community this year. UAIM was born of the global HIV AIDS struggle, which cost many millions of lives before those publicly funded drugs became widely available at affordable prices through the advocacy of people all around the world, just like us in this room this morning. Now, that fight clarified the stakes and the terms of global debates over access to medicines and intellectual property, or put differently, the balance between the rights of corporations and the rights of the people. In its aftermath, activists have worked to protect that balance of rights and power, and some of us, though not enough, have worked to help countries use their rights to make them real, to create precedent, overcoming pharma's power where necessary to protect health. That's what I was hired to do, compulsory licensing specifically, and I can see now that in one sense, uh, the role was to bridge the HIV crisis all the way through the COVID crisis to protect the early gains and to make new progress in those intervening years and to create examples as well as to save lives. And so those early victories don't simply fall away. We won quite a bit in that time. Uh, in Latin America, where I concentrated my work, patient groups and health groups organized, supported their governments where needed, challenged their governments, even embarrassed their governments where necessary, and won price reductions to make, uh, won price reductions for HIV meds, for cancer meds, to import affordable meds, to manufacture and use generic medicines, to overcome the kind of patent barriers that Alex was talking about, to penalize pharmaceutical misconduct and make medicines more affordable. We also defeated major efforts by uh, Big Pharma to upset the early balance, to make the rules worse and the monopolies, the monopolies longer in countries around the world. We defeated a major Pacific Rim trade deal that would have expanded patent power, longer terms for more drugs. For example, we moved the US government to adopt protections for access to meds in its trade deals. This is what Alex was talking about, the pet snake on a leash, on a leash which by the way, Alex, maybe next time you go to a cocktail party, you really want people to run, maybe bring the snake on a leash. Um, fundamentally, pharma's power persisted through that time. And when COVID struck, governments gave too much power to the pharmaceutical industry to set the terms of its sale and delivery of vaccines, leading to access delayed and access denied. High prices, higher prices for poor countries than for rich ones, and a regime of vaccine apartheid where poor people receive poor vaccines or no vaccines, where recovery in the global south was long delayed and at least a million more people needlessly lost their lives in the year long wait for any vaccines at all. And many of us fought hard during COVID, many people in this room working together as a global access to medicines movement. Many of my friends, I think, lament the lack of revolution, uh, persistently disappointed at the strength of the powers allayed against us. I see it a little differently. I look at the difference made because we were here. And that's the value I wanna see, the value of my life, the value of our work. The world is better because we were here. We brought a measure of justice to an unjust time. We helped protect lives. If it weren't for the advocacy, the research, the insights and passion of the access to medicines community, there would have been many more deaths a more anemic global response, a lack of solidarity or of concern for equity, less support for COVAX and for global vaccination efforts, less public assertion 
a power, for example, at NIH to finally assert, we the people invented this vaccine. We were co-equal partners with Moderna from the beginning in the development of the most effective COVID vaccine. And you companies will recognize our role. You will do more to make it available to the world. Advocacy created the technology sharing efforts at the World Health Organization, CTAP and HTAP, in which Dr. So is so involved, and induced companies to share finally with the medicines patent pool. It's important to see this progress because it keeps our courage up and allows us to make a life of justice, not just do it for a short time, but see the, see the progress year to year and to inspire others to join us. So out of those COVID empowerment efforts come new possibilities today. The world is indeed different and has woken up in at least three regards, reflected in negotiations of a global pandemic accord to which many of our friends are contributing now. First, we, the world as a whole, has to fight pandemics and fight them in advance at a higher, more political, more invested level than we've ever done before. And we have to be prepared far in advance. That's recognized now, I think, in governments around the world and prioritized. No one can go it alone. We have to work together as one world. There must be efforts at equity because it's fair. And also, it's in our interest. We need each other to cooperate and we need to support each other if we are to expect contributions. Uh, and because pathogens, of course, do not respect national borders. And third, every part of the world needs the capabilities and the freedom to stand up for themselves, to make their own medical tools, and to contribute and improve the science and research in turn. What Gabrielle said, not a new idea, but a reborn idea and something that we have to entrench, make powerful, and make enduring today. Today, there's a consensus to support regional manufacturing making tools in Africa and supporting their purchase at African institutions that has not existed uh, in quite some time. On Friday evening, right as we were all sitting down to this conference to be together again at last, thank you, Justin, for bringing us all back together in person. It feels different and it feels good. Um, the White House released a paper on global equitable access to medicines. That too is a direct response to our work together and a recognition that access to medicines is a serious, cogent, global challenge meriting the political attention and the technical and financial resources of what is still the world's most powerful country. It is in itself uh, an achievement and something that wouldn't have happened uh, without us. And the three ideas I mentioned, fighting pandemics globally together with support for regional empowerment and response, they're embedded in this White House document. I've shared it in the chat and folks want to review. But what's not there uh, is appreciation that equity is not only about outcomes. It's about participation. And it's perhaps less about charity than about justice. Sharing doses is charity. Sharing knowledge is justice. We're not just in this together. We have to make the decisions and make the change together. And in that regard, there's still from the White House and the pandemic accord negotiations and everywhere we're looking, far too much power reserved for the rich, decisions by the North, by public-private partnerships, by Bill Gates, by the drug corporations that benefit financially. Where is the independence for the global South? Where is the power of the public? Where is the justice? Well, that's the task that falls to us. We have examples underway at the World Health Organization I'd like to highlight the mRNA technology transfer program backed by WHO based in South Africa with producers from 15 Southern countries working together to share knowledge, to share science, to share technology, to advance new manufacturing initiatives and ultimately introduce and sustain new vaccine production, sharing instead of monopolizing the science along the way. And the health technology access pool, a place where governments can pool their knowledge, their resources, their technology and build better development of medical tools from the ground up. These are critical new possibilities we have to support. But there's one that speaks specifically to UAEM, and that's the change of guard at the National Institutes of Health. NIH might be the most important research entity uh, in the world. Change NIH, change the world. After years of stasis in protecting drug corporations under Francis Collins, who sort of led NIH for a generation and stymied change for a generation. NIH has a new director today, Monica Bertagnoli. She doesn't come from our access to medicines world. I can't say she's a friend exactly of our movement, but she's listening. I believe she cares about access to medicines at least, and she's been pressed with all of our help by Senator Sanders and others 
put on notice, she has to make progress on global access. It's a mandate, and they've reflected an appreciation of that mandate. So we've met with NIH since then. We've met with the White House, and we know that uh, conversations are well underway to introduce the first ever framework for prom promoting global access to NIH inventions. NIH will publish some kind of draft policy in the months ahead. We expect there will be a notice and comment to which UA must respond, strongly suggesting improvements. It is right in our wheelhouse. It will require technical work and a vision of justice. Will the medicines that we, the people, pay to develop be available to everyone everywhere? Will that access be timely? Will the companies be accountable, their practices transparent, the information, the trials released to the public? Will it be participatory? Will developing countries be able to contribute and to provide for their people? And we'll need allies at universities to weigh in. Preferably, UAM will already have spoken to NIH, already submitted ideas, already organized at universities, even before that first publication of a policy uh, from NIH, because it's the first draft that matters most, right? That's the idea to which everyone will respond. And there's a brief moment now to contribute to and shape that idea. But even after, well after, we'll be in a long arc uh, of newly shaping the values of biomedical research because it's a new day, because we experienced COVID and because we've got new leadership in NIH and because we've got Senator Sanders at help in the Biden administration, at least for the moment, um, and quite a bit of work to be done with that opportunity. Uh, we can envision an effort to get our allies at universities on board, to weaken opposition from the pro pharma tech transfer offices, to publish letters, to use the skills you learned this weekend. Everyone in this room has the power and the ability to contribute. The work we do on access plans at universities will in turn inform how far NIH goes, how far NIH thinks it can go, because it looks at the values of biomedical research and licensing and access um, at its constituency, the research universities across the country, and vice versa. How far NIH goes and how far we influence them will influence the culture on our campuses. The world is sensitive after COVID to the need to stand for equity, at least a little bit. So this is our time. This is UAIM's time to build on 20 years of learning at UAIM and across the Access to Medicines movement to take back our meds, to say our labs, our drugs, our responsibility. And yes, even we have a drug problem. To say that science can be and must be for humanity. So let's work it out and get it done. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Peter. That was a really inspiring speech to hear. And definitely, it's a like you said, it's, it's a really cool time to get into all this and see all that's happening in the world right now and all that is to come. Right now, I want to open up the floor for any questions that people have for our panelists. Um, if you have a question, just, I guess, raise your hand and I'll run over to you with the microphone. So do we have any questions to start off? If not, I can also ask questions. All right, Dr. So. Thanks for the wonderful set of presentations. I, and it's very unusual for us to have an anthropological perspective, I think, on these issues. And I think that's a real value add to our discussions. I did want to explore this, these issues because I think many of our, the countries we hope to also benefit um, and who are sometimes distant from actually where we sit now, um, in fact, struggle with the issues that you're raising, particularly the issue of regional versus local. And, and I think there's a big distinction between the two. And I wonder how Madagascar might be, in fact, struggling with that. Um, and there are oftentimes these tensions between, in fact, of course, um, the local perspective and larger, of course, um, regimes in which they must sit within. So for example, CBO Plus, actually, the local um, COVID-19 remedy you mentioned, in fact, it came under a press release, um, was released from the World Health Organization in 2021, raising questions about whether, in fact, there was an effective antiviral treatment and whether or not, I think they were pointing to maybe CBO Plus may have not achieved yet that level of actually proof or actually use. But also, just also as a, we look at the local production issues in Africa, you know, a lot of the struggles between, are you really going to create actually with a local facility, 
national sec health security even, or even regional health security. And again, because the market's only 28 million or so, I think in Madagascar, you know, the question is, you know, do you have the disease prevalence? Do you have the infrastructure to really build local? And is that the best way to go forward? I'd just be curious again, hearing from the ground, what sort of perspectives you gained on those issues. Thank you for that. It's a it's a very important question and one that I consistently saw people trying to figure out. Um, you know, I was doing remote research in Madagascar through 2020. I was back in 2021 and then there through 2023. So I feel very privileged to have gotten like a very long term sort of look at how this effort to build this industry played out. Um, you're right that there were, you know, there's these sort of ongoing uh, concerns about efficacy, about quality. Um, Madagascar originally commercialized like this drinkable COVID remedy that's just called CVO um, that did come under pretty extensive international backlash. Um, the medicinal plants that were included in it had been shown to be in vitro effective against SARS during the 2003 outbreaks. Um, and Madagascar had been growing those plants extensively to make anti-malarial medications. And so there's this sense of like, okay, we have a, a preliminary evidence of some sort of efficacy of antiviral activity. Uh, so let's just sort of throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Um, they then commercialized CVO plus, which is the pharmaceutical compound, um, not the drinkable compound um, that has been evaluated in by various teams and efforts are still ongoing to validate it as a therapy. Um, I, I know many people that sort of relied on it regardless. Um, and I think that these questions about how to how to have uh, domestically produced medicines uh, be quickly evaluated and then quickly validated or not validated is a very important one. Um, Madagascar was, you know, in its efforts to sort of become the kind of pharmacy of Africa, was very much trying to address this question about local versus regional, right, um, and, and sustainable industry. Uh, the population is 26 million. It's extremely difficult to move medical ingredients throughout the island. There's only like five major roads, and this is a landmass that's 1,000 miles tip to tip and 500 miles wide. Um, so you have a massive landmass, and um, it's very difficult to, to even get things to uh, folks that may, may need um, access to therapeutic resources. Uh, so the island was uh, attempting to sell, um, you know, broker contracts with places like Mauritius, Tanzania, Cameroon, uh, there's this broader kind of gesture to sort of pan-Africanism, um, or if not, or supporting Malagasy industry, as well as this sort of, um, you know, we no longer have to be reliant on sort of global north imports, we can figure out how to make this ourselves. We've seen a version of that uh, pan out as well with efforts in South Africa to make mRNA based vaccines. Um, as well as other necessary therapeutics. And there have been efforts throughout East Africa to build um, sort of sustainable drug supply, uh, supply chains since the 1990s um, with varying success. So I think this will be one of the questions of the, of the sort of coming kind of post-pandemic period is to what extent can these uh, industrial changes really be uh, sustainable, can be long-term, can, uh, can work in sort of non-crisis contexts, uh, and to what extent can the sort of geography of drug development and drug production really kind of rearrange uh, to most benefit sort of global South populations? Thank you. Other questions? Um, thank you all for a really instructive talk. Um, I have a question that kind of touches on each of your um, topics, which is um, we've talked a little bit about kind of the downsides of developing countries being reliant on imports from high income countries like the US, but I'm kind of wondering about the flip of that which is the US has been experiencing um, severe drug shortages recently. And a lot of that is tied to bulk ingredients that are manufactured in developing countries, um, especially in India. We've seen a lot of um, drug manufacturers based in India receiving warning letters and suspension, suspension letters from the FDA. Um, and particularly related to Alex's talk about patent thickets, um, when a lot of the know-how about making those drugs is not explicitly disclosed in patents, um, there's been a move to move a lot of drug manufacturing back to the US. Do you see that kind of posing a problem um, for developing countries um, who may not have access to the knowledge required to make drugs, um, especially when that knowledge is not explicitly disclosed in patents? Yeah. Um, 
So I think what we'd like to see is investment in health security the world over, the United States and internationally, and that the experience of COVID wakes us up to the need to take further public responsibility for the production of medicines, access to the materials, and insight into the supply chain and the plans of manufacturers uh, at every level, enhanced in the United States, but not at the expense of uh, production abroad. So we don't want to fall into, and many of our allies, well, not many, some of our erstwhile allies have fallen into sort of an America first uh, approach to this. I think that that um, seeks to capitalize on America first politics and fear monger about China and ignore the critical role that India and China have played um, supplying the world. It is perfectly possible and coherent to push for more stringent regular, well, that's really the wrong term, but more effective regulatory authority and monitoring and quality standards and penalties for misconduct um, the world over, have more inspections uh, internationally, uh, and uh, and n enhance, that, enhance that supply globally. So here at home, we should invest, we should require more transparency into the uh, supply chain, and we can even investigate the public production of more medicines. And I think Reshman and company are working on this, uh, Melissa Barber and others at, at Yale uh, right now, to look at the options for funding public production of essential medicines and recognizing that those two are sort of critical inputs in the national security that uh, should not be abandoned or just left to profit-making corporations and a high barrier to entry industry where they can fall out uh, at any time, you know, we're like the sort of the best case, you know, scenario is a Martin Shkreli farmer bro kind of situation where they, they jack the price uh, up immensely because they can. And the worst case is just not having any medicines at all. There's no reason we have to accept that. There's no reason that, you know, the United States can't produce its own medicines and encourage the production of quality medicines abroad and take some responsibility for people's health. It's like everything. I mean, there are, there are various ideas out there, but it's primarily a political project if we have the will to make that investment. I'll, I'll hop in um, to say, you know, the that issue of, you know, trade secrecy and patents is a really important one because the whole point is you're supposed to disclose how to make and use something. And I also think that there's a place for pushing back against what the PTO has allowed for a long time, which is a lot of secrecy around things that are patented. You shouldn't you shouldn't be able to get a patent and keep how to make the thing you're claiming secret. That, that's just completely at odds with the purpose of the system. It absolutely happens, but it's not something that we should accept as okay and, and actually consistent with the law. And it's happening in, in industries aside from medicine increasingly. It happens in agriculture around uh, particular seed varieties. It happens now increasingly in the uh, AI space. And so I think that's actually like a front to also be fighting about. Uh, and, and I am, you know, I do think that I'm skeptical about private uh, pharma companies in the US, um, you know, investing in manufacturing, uh, partly because I think patents, I think patents are part of the reason and that they, you know, they can in the US charge such a high, you know, profit margin off of you know and and manufacture relatively low scale and so the the profit incentive to you know invest in the capacity to make dramatically more scale where they're not they're going to be making it you know comparatively a really small marginal profit um is why you know I, I agree with peter that we can proceed on most on multiple fronts and that we probably will need public efforts to get those manufacturing uh, scale off the ground in the us thank you All right, I have one more question to ask you guys. I think it's been really interesting learning about the uh, patenting system and like what goes into that. So we've talked a lot about how patents have been used, you know, perhaps negatively. For you guys, do you think there's, I guess two questions, feel free to choose either one. One, like should the patenting system even exist in the first place? Like in this, in this day and age where information is proliferated this fast, is the patent system still useful in your opinions? And then secondary, if you think it's still useful, like what's one thing you think would be the most important thing to change about it? Both, you know, global patenting, US patenting, or like in other countries as well. 
any of you can answer, feel free. Well, I've, I've got a thing. Uh, so we were asked, we were invited to an NIH forum last year where they asked us what they should do about uh, NIH owned inventions and their patenting policy. And I think the expectation was that consumer groups would come and say, you should just put that stuff in the public domain. But we actually had a different answer, which was we want NIH to patent, so long as there's going to be a patent system and sort of the commercial structure with the way we have it, we want NIH to patent its inventions and claim credit and title and use that as leverage uh, for the other manufacturers that want access to those inventions to go out and make medicines. In other words, if, you know, if we're going to have patents in the pharmaceutical sector, then the US government too and other public institutions around the world have to be able to say, we're making great stuff, and if you want to use our great stuff, uh, then you're going to need to negotiate with us access conditions for the world. You're going to make the NIH Moderna vaccine available and affordable uh, to the world's people and negotiate with us a license uh, to get that done. So there, there are times when it can be used uh, in a positive structure. Um, I don't know that I will sort of have adequate perspective on the, you know, it's a big question whether it should be patents at all, but I mean, here's here's the thing. It's it was it's a technology neutral idea that dates back to 15th century Venice and was never meant to have anything to do with pharmaceuticals and it only does today because of the influence of pharmaceutical industry lobbyists. So no one would design a system from scratch today where you just grant 20 year monopolies on new drugs. It's it's inevitably going to lead to treatment rationing and is not the most useful way to to construct innovation either. So it needs significant reform. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll lead to others the question of, of whether it can be changed or not, but we should we should be crystal clear that it wasn't made for the purpose we're using it uh, for. And we should be very bold about suggesting things, suggesting systems that actually make sense for what we want, which is access plus innovation and rational use, the right kind of drug development for our real health needs available, accessible to everyone in timely fashion in a system in which all our universities and, and labs uh, and programs around the world can make a contribution. Yeah, just I want to add to that, that I think that the history of patenting for pharmaceuticals can actually be very instructive here. Uh, the first uses of patents for uh, pharmaceuticals was actually for insulin in the 1920s. Um, up until then, it was actually deemed unethical to patent medicine because you were keeping a secret. Um, and that that idea that uh, a, a, a therapy would have secrets baked into it really called into question the trustworthiness of a medical practitioner in the first place. Those ideas re really changed radically with the development of insulin, um, where people started to see it as really in the public interest to patent medicines because it meant that you could ensure quality uh, rather than, for example, everyone extracting, um, you know, like pancreatic extracts from cows. You could figure out how to control that process in order to uh, ensure you know, quality insulin for people that needed it. Um, so the development of these systems was really with a vision of a public interest that then has become, become sort of steadily eroded uh, with, you know, various deregulations of industries and the establishment of the types of patent tickets and patent abuses that Alex spoke about. Um, so if we ask, you know, should patent exist, should patents exist, I think that we can um, sort of harken back to some of the earlier histories of IP protections in the public interest to really kind of re-envision what would it mean to to use patents, as um, Peter said, as as ways to encourage, you know, medicines for a public good or medicines for public access. Um, the moment that we're in right now has, n has not been the dominant mode um, of using patents to protect medicines and protect public health, and it's very possible, I think, to, to imagine sort of new ways forward. Um, and in that sense, a uh, very solid understanding of how the system even came to be in the first place and how patents were originally established uh, with an eye towards protecting patient populations, um, I think can, can help us a lot here. Thank you. I'll jump in. In the 70s, uh, Congress did a study on whether we should have a patent system. It was the era of, you know, stagnation, and, and they're really trying to figure out how to reboot the American economy. And the folks who did the study concluded that, you know, the, I, I, the evidence does not allow me to make the conclusion that having a patent system uh, is going to increase innovation. 
It also doesn't allow us to conclude that getting rid of the patent system that we have would increase innovation. So I think that basically it's neutral at, at best as to whether we're you know better off, but we do have one. And probably my, my take is that practically the fight to get rid of it would be kind of a, an enormous amount of time and effort that could be better spent reforming it and other measures to make it serve its you know, what we want of promoting innovation and access better and that we don't need to you know if the we don't need to accept the status quo and to the extent the part of the theory of the patent system is increasing disclosure increasing access ensuring access that there should be a way to make those you know those goals rise back to the surface and i think that the public interest has eroded is is exactly right and you know there should be ways for example for people to disclose their inventions like with maybe without getting uh monopolies you know for a lot of open source inventions how do you define what you did so that nobody else can patent it but maybe say i really want to make sure this will be accessible to people so i think we can think creatively and push and and make the system that we have do what it's supposed to a whole lot better awesome thank you so much